Hello and welcome to another edition of another book review. This week I'll be reviewing The Fight to Save the Town by Michelle Wilde Anderson. I'll talk very briefly about the author, go into an overview of what the book is about, talk about what I liked about it, what I didn't like about it, who I'd recommend the book to, and finish off with what I'll be reading for next time. Michelle Wilde Anderson is a professor at Stanford. She's had her work also appear in uh, several different publications, I believe the New York Times, as well as the Los Angeles Times and Chicago Tribune. Uh, this book, The Fight to Save the Town, is the result of some research that she's done, some uh, examination really of four towns between roughly 2016 to 2020, uh, all of whom uh, she has identified as being 20% under the, the poverty line as well as the median wage being two-thirds of the folks in uh, that state. So she identifies these four towns and basically gives you a profile of each of the towns and explains how through, some, in some cases, neglect, in some cases, active mistakes by the local government, the effects of, of this government policy has impacted the town members uh, negatively. So the four towns are Stockton, California, uh, Josephine County in Oregon, Lawrence, Massachusetts, and Detroit. And she has a, a brief section on each one of them, the history of that, those, those places, and what the government has done there in order to put the residents in, in kind of this precarious position where they uh, at least 20% of them are under the poverty line and, and the median uh, income is two-thirds of the state. So what I liked about this book, it reminded me very much of kind of the flip side of Richard Florida and his idea of the superstar cities. These are kind of the, the places where the superstar cities uh, um, are not. And so uh, you have places like Detroit where you had a large auto industry uh, produce really middle-class jobs and better for a long time. Uh, as that kind of slowly left, Detroit was kind of more and more hollowed out as people left Detroit um, either to go to suburbs or other places as those jobs left. Stockton was a major rail shipping spur as well as a, a place where I believe the federal government uh, worked in a wartime uh, production. Josephine County was a, a timber um, focus or timber, a timber town and the government, the federal government basically offered them some money to offset uh, timber jobs or logging jobs as uh, endangered species were discovered there. So uh, roughly 20 years ago, 20, 1992, the government came in and said, federal government came in and said, we're going to pay you this money, but you're not allowed to, 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 to cut, to clear cut. So over time, that those payments basically were used to uh, prop up uh, services in the town. It has a very libertarian streak as far as not wanting to raise taxes on itself. And this book basically covers that section of what happens when that, that money runs out from the federal government when they cut that money after the 2008 financial crisis. Um, they decide, the federal government decides to cut that money and that's what happens to that. And Lawrence, Massachusetts has is, is long been a looming in Milltown and uh, that section is really about what happened when those jobs uh, went away and what happened to the people there. So each of those sections, that's really my favorite part of the book, was really the history of each of these cities and understanding how the, the government policies a lot of times made a situation worse uh, or failed to step in and service uh, the residents in that area. There's a long section in Stockton, the Stockton section that's on uh, trauma because uh, Stockton is one of the most highest homicide rates in the country and it kind of goes over why that is and in the the really specific needs of that place. Um, and she does a good job of going through the ACE metric and, and kind of all those things. And I, I like that the the parts of the Je Detroit chapter deal with gentrification, I thought, in an interesting way. Um, I wish there had been a little bit more on that uh, from other sides, other viewpoints, but that was uh, also kind of a highlight in the book. So those are the things that I liked. I think her, her writing style is pretty, pretty clear. There are times where I wish she had gone into more detail and kind of drawn out some of the examples. I also noticed there were times where she went on to kind of these like brief um, diversions that didn't really add very much to the book. There's a, a part where she talks about Stockton and the needs of Stockton and how in California they have a registry of gang members. And if you're on this registry, 
uh, you're not eligible to receive certain services if you were a member or if you were a victim of a crime and on this registry you weren't able to receive um, rehabilitation or, or uh, traumatic assistance uh, in order to go talk to a therapist or whatnot. And she had a, a, a member who had a guy who had been. She just describes him as a dealer. She doesn't really say what she he was dealing. Presumably he was a drug dealer, but he kind of made a point that he wasn't in a gang. And really, from from the outside, it was a little bit splitting hairs of whether or not this guy's in a gang or a drug dealer. And it's it was a strange to me diversion. There's also a point where she talks about people eating lead paint. There was also kind of a, a diversion. And then as someone who is in AmeriCorps, there's a part where she talks about an AmeriCorps team that's in in Massachusetts. Um, I don't want to bore you with the ins and outs of that, but the way that that information was presented was used to prop up her idea that it, that outsiders are are part of the problem sometimes, and they need they need to be more integrated into to the community. Well, part of the AmeriCorps thing is is team members would go to to places that sounded like an ISP, and it's usually the onus is on the person who is sponsoring that. Usually, a town's member or whoever is in the community sponsors that project. That person would be the person who's responsible for reaching out to the town and town members if they want to join the. In this, in this example, it was a park cleanup, but she doesn't really seem to connect that, so I don't know where the miscommunication with that was. Um, so there's there are those things. The other issues I had with it, there there are a few different issues. I think that the biggest issue I had was really I didn't really see who the book was for. I was reading this, and and she kind of makes a point where. Um, she says, you know, I, I've kind of laid out these, these, these places and I want you to know that there are people there who are working really hard to make these places better. And I want you to, to understand that they are doing it through mutual aid and uh, organizing. And I was like, okay, that's, that's fair. And then it's just, like I said, there's a, a streak throughout the book of her being um, weary of outsiders. But it, there are times where she gives, you know, organizing and, and mutual aid are typical, typically ideas associated with anarchy. And she doesn't really ever come down on, are you asking for more government? Are you asking for less government? You don't ask for a UBI, which to me would kind of bring a lot of the things that you're talking about together and, and wanting to make these places, places where people can come in, live there if they want to live there or move away if they want to move away. But there are like good paying jobs and there are options for them to do these different things. She doesn't really talk about economic growth in a way that I think would, would really behoove her to given the amount of poverty in these areas. And she doesn't really seem to tie together the idea of businesses coming in in order to provide jobs for people. And in a very similar way to Evicted by Matthew Desmond, there was, a, to me, a, a hole at the, the middle of that book to, that didn't talk about jobs. And a lot of what she's talking about is she uses phrases like invest in the community. And, and I thought that that was interesting because in this book, the people that she interviews are, are largely, I would say, uh, working people and poor people. And even though the, the demographics of it, or there's a large portion of these folks who are, by definition, under the poverty line, she doesn't ever really, when she says, you know, the community should decide this, this stuff, and the community should decide where the fund is, and we should be investing in the community. It's not clear if she means the community being the city, the county, the state. It's not clear to me if she means the country. She just kind of has this idea that the money will flow to these these people, but doesn't explain, you know, how and why that would happen. And if the issue is, which it is in a lot of these places, there's there's not a lot of money. And so it's like, well, where is the money coming from? Is the onus on people who are wealthier people in the town to provide for these services? Do you want people who are in the state to provide from them? She has a, a large part of the book is her talking about organi organizations that are doing it right and they're raising money and they're organizing in the community, but they still get a lot of their money from grants. And you're like, well, so you are calling for some federal assistance in these places if, if they're getting it through federal grant money. And so it, it was unclear of the takeaway from all this. And I found myself kind of again and again coming back to like, I don't understand what, what point you're ultimately trying to make other than there are people in these places that are trying to, to better themselves. And, you know, how much you need to, to, how much that point needs to be reiterated, you know, I think differs from person to person. Um, but that to me was a little was a little frustrating because there there's a part where she says at the end of the book she's like well I'm not going to use this por portion of the book to prescribe things I think it's really up to every community to make that decision but again you know when you say that do you want people who are middle class people to have a say do you want people who are upper middle class people to say do you want wealthy people to have a say do you not want them to have a say and what happens when they want something different than what these people want or working poor people and poor people want she doesn't really go into that either and so a lot of these things. 
you kind of see the other side of her narrative where you're like, well, this was probably a result of, of middle class people wanting to do this or, or upper middle class people wanting to do that. And so it, it wasn't quite, quite clear to me what the ultimate point of it was. Um, there are times where, like I said, I think that, that she plays a little fast and loose with, with some factual stuff. She talks about the mayor of Stockton who does, did propose some kind of universal basic income like system, but he was voted out of office very quickly. And she kind of makes, gives reasons why he was voted out, out of office, but doesn't really, which don't really align with the fact that the, the, the community had organized to get him in office. Well, why weren't they able to organize to, to keep him in office? And so that wasn't clear. Um, there's this couple of places where she doesn't really explain terms particularly well, like a land contract, which is not something I'm familiar with and I don't think is a particularly in common use. Um, so yeah, there were a lot of issues I had with the book. I, I felt that it was, if you want the, if you want the understanding of, of what places that ha are in this kind of economic situation have gone through, I thought these were really good snapshots of them. She also kind of explains the Josephine County I thought was interesting because uh, you see they're, they're trying to, or one of the ideas for them to raise money was to make that more of a, a mecca or hub for marijuana production. But then she explains, you know, in Oregon, you're allowed to grow and to sell, but you're only allowed to, whatever you grow in Oregon, you also have to sell, sell in Oregon. So it's kind of led to a glut in the market. And so the price is not particularly great um, there. She also kind of gets into this weird digression about the, the healthcare system of them trying to be a commuter city for people to provide health care to, but then she talks about racism and I thought a way that didn't really make any sense to me. So I had my issues with it and uh, I wish the message behind what she was trying to get at was clear. I do think that the, the examination of these four cities to give you the history of the city I thought was interesting. She does have, in my opinion, a pretty clear bias, a leftist bias, but you know, if you can get over that and you're like, okay, well that's like this part of it, then I think that it's 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 fine, but you, I, I think it's helpful to know that going in, um, and I wish there had been more at the end of prescriptions of okay, here's what we can do to help these people, here's the ultimate goal, here's why it's important. And it, that part of it really wasn't never clicked with me of well, why if I don't live in one of these cities should I feel real great, you know, painstaking detail that we need to like work to to resolve this. And if you're not able to tell me what I can do to help the situation, if someone who doesn't live there that I think the book kind of has failed. So there's, those were my frustrations with it. I think if you liked, uh, if you liked Charged by Emily Bazelon and if you liked um, Evicted by Matthew Desmond, you like this. I will say of the three of them, Emily Bazelon did put forth the most like here, 21 steps that we can do to kind of start to solve this problem. Matthew Desmond also kind of put some steps forward as far as, they're probably not the most realistic steps, but they, they were a couple steps forward to how, what he could see, what he sees as ways to alleviate the eviction crisis. Um, I wish she had just put more stuff into the end of it of how do we get people out of poverty and when you talk about investing in people, you, you need to do a better job of showing long term how that leads to getting out of poverty in a way that I, I don't think was ever really made particularly clear. And she kind of just says, you know, if we threw all this money at people that we had thrown at land developers, then like magically, then we would have gotten people out of poverty. And I just don't think it is that simple. And uh, I wish she had spent a little bit more time developing that. So. That is The Fight to Save the Town. Next time I will be reading the John Truby, uh, the genre book by John Truby that I don't have the title in front of. But if you have read this book, I'm interested in what other people thought of it. I know she's been on a couple podcasts that I'm gonna try to listen to after I upload this. But if you have other opinions of this and you, if you think that uh, I was way off base or you wanna add anything, uh, please let me know. I'd be interested to hear uh, other opinions. Until next time, bye.